I call myself a science writer, but I'm not really. I really think of myself as a nonfiction writer. So let me talk about how in my second book, Worldwide Mind, I tried to integrate the way I talked about art and science. And let me start by comparing it to the way most other books do this. So take, for example, Eric Kandel's book, In Search of Memory. So Kandel won the Nobel Prize back in 2000 for his research on the neural and biological basis of memory. So he wrote this memoir, In Search of Memory. And there are two different threads running through the book. There is a science thread where he talks about the neural basis of memory, and that's fascinating. And there's another thread where he talks about his experience growing up to become a scientist. So he talks about growing up in Nazi Austria in the 1930s, coming to the United States, making his career as a young scientist. So the book has these two different threads that run through it. It's got the science thread, and it's got the autobiography thread. And they're both fascinating. And there's clearly some kind of connection because the book is about memory. So he talks about his own personal memory and the science of memory. Nonetheless, you could separate these two threads quite easily. You could pull out all the science and make that a book of its own, an expository book. And you could pull out the memoir and make that a standalone memoir on its own without any trouble. So the two are interleaved, but they don't really depend on each other. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that I set out to do something different in my book, Worldwide Mind. I want to integrate the science of the book with a memoiristic autobiographic story. So let me talk a little bit about how I did that. So the science of the book is about neuroscience, specifically the neuroscience of reading what's going on inside a brain. And there is the title, which is strangely reassuring. So you can see there the, the title and the subtitle. So the book, on the surface, is about mind reading. It is about new neuroscience technologies that enable scientists to look at what's going on inside a brain's neural circuitry and make inferences about that mind's conscious experience. Now, that's been done with functional MRI, for example, but that is several decades old. There are much newer technologies, one of which is called optogenetics, where you genetically modify neurons so that they can be switched on and switched off using light. And this technology gives scientists the ability to probe what individual functional circuits of neurons are doing while the subjects in this case, usually an animal, goes through some kind of experience. And these technologies allow us to relate the, the mouse's neural activity with that mouse's actual experience. So these technologies are letting us delve into the privacy of the skull in unprecedented detail. So that is the science half of the book. Now, in the memoiristic half, I talk about my own experiences learning how to communicate better. So specifically, I talk about two things. I talk about going to workshops in Northern California that were about communication. And in these workshops, we did things like look into each other's eyes, which is unexpectedly hard to do and also unexpectedly rewarding. So these workshops were about communication. They were about intimacy. They were about connection. So these are the two different halves of the book, the science half and the memoiristic half. But in the book, stylistically and structurally, I sought to connect them. And here's how I did it. So I pointed out that we normally think of our thoughts as the most private thing there is. When you have a dream or a thought or a memory, only you know that you're having it. It's the most ultimately private thing that there is. But I point out that in our society, that we are taking this sensation of privacy to an extreme. A lot of people are very concerned that with technology like our Blackberries, or iPhones, email, texting, people are becoming less and less able to be intimate with each other. They are less able to open themselves up to each other's experience 
they are less willing to be intimate with each other. There's a fascinating book by Sherry Turkle, for example, called Alone Together, where she characterizes how a new generation of teenagers is less willing and less able to communicate in an open-ended way with other people. It's an alarming, riveting, fascinating book. So I read these two stories together. I talk about the fact that our technology appears to be alienating us from each other, while at the same time we're developing new technologies that potentially make it possible for us to literally know each other's thoughts, our bodily experiences. But we are constructing a society where we are less and less willing to know those things, where we are less willing to communicate and to collaborate and to be intimate. So structurally, I interweave these two stories. So I will go on for a few paragraphs about my experience at the workshop. Then I follow that with several paragraphs about optogenetics or functional MRI. But I do it in such a way that when I'm talking about one thing, I'm also really talking about the other. So when I'm talking about optogenetics, I'm also talking about intimacy and privacy. And when I talk about my experiences in the workshops, I'm also talking about the kinds of things we've lost and need to gain back with technology. So I try to interweave these two together in a way which I think is stylistically and structurally innovative and new. So that's why I think that this kind of book is a new kind of book, it's a new kind of venture, a new kind of science writing. So let me talk about the title for a moment. Now, that title looks as geeky as it's possible to get. Okay, the coming integration of humanity, machines, and the internet. It makes it sound like a hard science book, which it is. There's a lot of very deep science in the book about optogenetics, about probing brain circuitry. Now, I had a long argument with my publisher about that subtitle. I wanted to subtitle the book, The Coming Integration of Humanity and Machines, colon, a love story. Because that would have captured better what the book is about. Because the book actually has stories in it about connecting with people. There's also a subplot in the book about how I used the skills that I learned in those workshops to meet, woo, and ultimately marry the woman whom I married last October. So that story is also told in the book. So the book is literally a love story. But it's also a love story about what humanity can become, about how we can use technology to become more richly human, more richly connected, rather than less. But the point that I make by talking about the workshops is that we can't rely on technology to make us more willing to be open with each other, that we actually have to teach ourselves these skills, and we have to explicitly set out to learn these kinds of skills. And I point out, this is something we don't learn in school. We learn how to do math and trigonometry, but we don't learn how to look each other in the eyes, both literally and metaphorically speaking. So my publisher really pushed back on my adding the words of love story to the title, because they said, well, that means that booksellers won't be able to categorize the book. You know, the stock people will look at it, well, they won't be sure whether they're putting in the science section with a memoir section, with the romance section. So in my career, I have really struggled with these kind of distinctions. And I had the same fight with a different publisher for my first book, which is titled Rebuilt, How Becoming Part Computer Made Me More Human. And that book is also a science memoir. It tells the story of my going deaf, getting a cochlear implant, and learning how to hear all over again which was a tumultuous personal experience. But the book is also about my collision with the computer. And I made that experience into a metaphor for the fact that our entire society has collided with the computer. And it is transforming the way we communicate with each other. So in my first book, Rebuilt, I talk a great deal, for example, about online dating, which is a direct collision of the need to be intimate, to reach out to and connect, with the fact that to do it, you're sitting at a computer alone in your room. So 
So this is a fundamental contradiction that our society is still struggling to overcome. And I had the same subtitle st struggle with the first book. In fact, it was very hard to think of a subtitle for that first book because it doesn't really neatly fit into any of the neat categories of memoir, science writing, autobiography. It didn't neatly slot into any of those categories. So I find myself just writing books that are hard to categorize. But that's because I am trying to innovate a new way of writing about science, about human meaning, about communication, together in an integrated way that shows that these things cannot be pulled apart. So I will mingle afterward. You know, I welcome you to come up and talk to me. I also welcome you to take a look at my book on Amazon. You'll look at it outside. I hope you'll buy it and take a look at it. So for my third book, I'm trying to push that forward even further to talk about communication and connection on the largest scale possible, communication with extraterrestrial intelligences. How do we know what kind of codes allow intelligent minds from completely different cultures to communicate and to collaborate? And I think that's a profound and rich question that I'm itching to get at in my third book. Thank you very much.